All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Lemke, and I'm excited to be part of NREL's ongoing Wind Energy Science Leadership Series of webinars that include an ongoing series of educational webinars that include presentations and discussions on wind energy related topics featuring speakers from the laboratory, strategic partners, and the energy industry. These webinars will discuss the challenges facing wind energy and the pathways forward for making wind one of the most prevalent energy sources of the future. In today's webinar, you will hear from a panel of NREL researchers who will discuss research, engagement, and technological development activities to address environmental concerns associated with wind energy. Before we begin, today's webinar will be recorded and available on demand and posted on NREL's website in about two to three weeks. Please mute your lines and turn off your cameras if you're not speaking. Next, we encourage you all to use the chat feature and ask questions um, at the end of the session, or you can raise your hand and our facilitator will reach out to you specifically. And finally, I would like to introduce Jim Algrim, who is the Deputy Director of the Department of Energy's Wind Energy, Wind Energy Technologies Office. Jim. Thank you, Alex. And most people are probably wondering, where is Jocelyn Brown Saracino, who's been really this this program has been her child for the last uh, number of years, and she's done an excellent job of stewarding it, managing it, and uh, probably knows a lot of the people that are on the phone. Well, Jocelyn, we've, we've kicked her upstairs and for a temporary assignment where she's representing the the wind office uh, as the lead for offshore wind. This is a major initiative by President Biden. And so Jocelyn's been, been uh, you know, working the interagency, uh, the secretarial level the, with the White House and has been really doing an excellent job in, in getting that initi initiative going. So uh, I'm filling in for her for at least a, at least a few months uh, until we come up with maybe another another alternative, but and I'm and I'm glad I actually worked in this area for a little bit, maybe a decade ago. So I'm I'm glad to be back and working with it. And you know, over the years I've been with the uh, Department of Energy. I mean, we started out as a a, a technology development office, uh, really working on on, on wind turbine hardware, uh, reliability, costs, those kinds of things. And the environment and siting just kind of kept getting more and more important as the years went on to where now, uh, you know, with uh, to meet the deployment goals that the administration is looking at. I mean, really, for land-based wind, the environmental and siting is going to be the, you know, the key, uh, the key th issue that needs to be solved. And that's why I think we've got some, and and same with offshore wind. So I think uh, you know we've got some excellent uh, presentations lined up for you today. In general, we we fund this research to better understand the the impact impacts of wind turbines and really to develop solutions to those impacts and and so that we can continue with development of wind energy. So uh, we got some exciting uh, presentations. I won't uh, won't uh, delay that anymore, and I'll turn it over. I think to Chris. Chris Hine from NREL to introduce the speakers. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Jim, um, for the introduction and for the support that DOE has shown to um, the environmental program at, at NREL. Um, <clears throat> my name is Chris Hine. I'm a senior project leader at NREL and oversee the environmental portfolio. I've been with NREL for about two and a half years. Um, and my, my background is in bat ecology, and I've been studying bat and wind turbine interactions for um, nearly 14 years. Um, and it's it's really been a, a pleasure uh, to work at NREL um, because of the diversity of portfolios. Um, so bringing some biological experience and working with um, people from engineering background, computer sciences, atmospheric sciences um, has, has been really exciting. Um, <clears throat> I want to introduce um, our other speakers today. We have three fabulous uh, researchers. Uh, Elliot Kwan is a staff researcher at NREL. Um, John Yarbrough is a research scientist and physicist. Um, and Rebecca Green is a senior project leader, and, and both are at NREL as well. 
And so the, the flow for the today's webinar are, are as follows. I'm going to give a real high overview of the environmental portfolio and highlight <clears throat> what NREL's role has been um, over the past 27 or so years. And then um, following that, uh, Elliot will give a presentation on eagle behavior prediction based on atmospheric modeling. John will discuss uh, machine learning based uh, tracking system using thermal video um, uh, cameras. And then Rebecca will talk about offshore wind environmental considerations. So just a little bit of background on, on why we are focused on um, environmental concerns. Um, and my presentation will focus mostly on land-based issues, uh, as Rebecca will talk about offshore later. Um, but in, in a nutshell, wind energy has, has obvious benefits. Um, it diversifies our, our energy sector, uh, creates jobs, um, reduces our carbon footprint, um, and so it has a lot of environmental benefits. Uh, but there are some unintended um, concerns or issues. And the, the interaction of, of wind energy and wildlife can result in delays in development or curtailment of operations. Um, and and that's, not, that's not what we want. We want to be able to produce renewable energy, but also protect our wildlife. Um, the, these, these impacts can occur at all phases of development. So prior to construction, through construction and, and operation of a facility, there can be direct or indirect impacts. Uh, direct impacts would be um, uh, a fatality event. Indirect impacts could be something that changes an animal's behavior um, or habitat disturbance. So an animal could be displaced from an area or avoid an area that it would normally um, use when a facility is constructed. And over time and, and geographic area, these um, impacts can add up and have cumulative effects um, on populations of, of species. But the good news is, um, is that over the 20 or so years that we've been studying uh, this issue, we do have solutions that are available uh, and being implemented uh, and others that are in the pipeline. So some, uh, if you look at the technology readiness level, there's, um, monitoring and mitigation solutions all along that, that level, um, <clears throat> those that are, are commercially available and, and others that are close and, and some that are um, in, in stages of, of validation. For land-based wind, we've really condensed um, these issues down to three species or species groups, uh, bats, raptors, and, and prairie grouse. For bats in particular, um, there are four species that are migratory. So they, they spend the summers um, in the US and Canada, but migrate long distances uh, during the winter to, to southern latitudes. Um, the, the impact um, for these is, is collision risk, risk, so it's a direct impact. Um, and it doesn't appear to be at random. Um, we have observed bats spending time flying in and out of the rotor swept area investigating the, the tower and then the cell and the blades. And so there's some sort of attraction that might be bringing some of these species in proximity and, and exposing them to, to the wind turbines. Uh, we we um, have a pretty good understanding of the, the scope of, of this issue, um, the species, the timing. Um, and so research now has focused more on why these animals are interacting with wind turbines and the, the strategies we can um, develop to minimize the impact. Uh, how can we make them more cost effective um, and, and so that they can be implemented broadly. With respect to raptors, golden eagles kind of are the um, <clears throat> species of, of most concern. Um, again, collision risk is, is the impact. Um, they don't appear to be attracted to wind turbines like bats do. They may just be using the same um, kind of conditions that are uh, good for, for wind energy. Um, there are airflow patterns created by heat and created by um, geographic structures like mountain cliffs um, that um, <clears throat> eagles and, and other soaring birds use to, to gain elevation. And when wind energy facility is sited in, in those locations, there can be interactions. Um, similar to bats, um, the focus on, on eagles has, has recently been on, on their behavior and how they're using the airspace, and Elliot will talk a little bit more about this. 
uh, and on minimization strategies. Prairie grouse are a little bit different. Um, the, the impact is, is indirect, um, so the, the construction and operation of, of a facility isn't going to cause collisions necessarily. It's, it's more going to be related to disturbance or displacement, uh, interfering with maybe their breeding cycles, nesting cycles. Um, and these species are of concern primarily because their habitat uh, has, has been dwindling over the years, grassland, prairies, sagebrush, um, uh, habitat is getting smaller and smaller. Um, and, and that's probably the main driver for, for these uh, concern for these birds. But um, we don't really know a lot about how they interact with wind energy facilities. There, there's certainly some data, but it, it varies by species. And so <clears throat> the focus really is, is just on understanding whether uh, wind energy um, does present um, a concern for these uh, uh, birds or not. <clears throat> So NREL's role, I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight two aspects of what NREL does in this space. Um, the first of which is, is um, forming uh, and maintaining collaboratives. Um, NREL has 27 years of, of working in, in the wind and environmental uh, research area. Um, Karen Sinclair and, and Bob Thresher deserve all the credit for the success of this program. They started it, they maintained it for uh, almost three decades, and um, it's it's been it it has positioned NREL to be a leader in um, this space. So um, we do a lot of activities to convene stakeholders to identify the key research priorities, and once those are established, um, actually conducting or supporting studies um, to monitor or mitigate the the impacts of wind energy on wildlife, and a lot of that is focused on. Um, developing technologies. Uh, internally, um, <clears throat> the environmental program, as I mentioned, <clears throat> um, partners with other aspects of NREL, and this is, I think, at least for me, the, the really exciting um, part of this job is to work with experts in computational sciences, atmospheric sciences, um, spatial analysis, cost modeling, late engineers, um, just the, the whole suite of, of what um, NREL is and, and about is um, has some sort of tie-in to uh, with the environmental program. Uh, we also work with all of the other stakeholders that are involved in this issue, so the regulatory community, uh, the wind industry, uh, other research organizations, and, and academia. And, and through these partnerships, um, NREL has established and supported um, several of the main uh, collaboratives or initiatives um, uh, in the space. Uh, so NREL was a founding member and supporter of the National Wind Coordinating Collaborative, which ran for about 26 years. Uh, we recently uh, ended this um, collaborative. We felt that it had um, run its course and, and that um, other efforts had, had grown out of it that could uh, continue on its role. Um, but the, the NWCC um, was instrumental in providing uh, early guidance for how we conduct monitoring studies. They did a lot of initial research and focus on prairie grouse and held um, biennial wind and wildlife research uh, conferences uh, that are really kind of the pinnacle for um, disseminating uh, research uh, to the broader stakeholder community. Uh, NREL is also a founder of the Bath and Wind Energy Cooperative, um, which is still ongoing and, and now uh, we're actually the, the coordinator for the cooperative. Uh, we, we took on that role uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, the BWAC um, uh, holds science meetings with uh, its members to establish research priorities, um, and they do this about every three years. So they're, they're short-term goals to, to find out what is the state of the science and what do we need to, to build off of that information. Um, it conducted some of the first studies looking at um, curtailing or using deterrence for reducing uh, fatalities and also serves as a peer review entity for those who want to um, submit their reports uh, for review um, before disseminating them. And, and um, lastly on the slide is REN. This is a, an international effort, part of the International Energy Agency's uh, technolo WIND Technology Collaboration Program. Um, 
NREL has served as the operating agent for this since its start, which was in 2012. We're now in the third four-year phase of, of REN. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, what we're focused on now is identifying international priorities, and Re Rebecca will talk a little bit about this in her presentation. Um, we also do a lot toward synthesizing the global state of the science, um, so conduct webinars, do research briefs, and uh, uh, white papers and publications. We're currently developing a technology database um, that will be housed on the, the TFS website um, and support the TFS website just in general. Um, which is, is uh, managed by the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, so really in conjunction with these collaborative efforts, um, NREL's other uh, main role is advancing technological solutions. And there's a, a number of mechanisms that we have to do this. Um, in previous years, we've had a, um, a technology development and innovation program that funded research um, and we've also um, been a part of uh, several funding opportunities through the Department of Energy. And, and one of these awards um, that uh, was available uh, starting a couple of years ago um, focused a lot on um, minim minimization for bats or uh, detecting uh, strikes using um, sensor technologies uh, installed on the blades. And so um, there are two here that I just want to highlight because I think they're, they're interesting and kind of show some of the variety of, of work that we're doing. Uh, one is looking at uh, species-specific species behaviors, um, behavioral responses to ultrasonic deterrence. Uh, and the other is um, our role in validating these strike detection technologies. So with respect to deterrence, um, the idea here is to produce um, ultrasound, generate ultrasound at the wind turbine um, to interfere or, or jam uh, the sonar that bats use. So bats uh, emit uh, frequencies. In the US, the species emit frequencies between 20 and 50 kilohertz. And if we can generate sound in that range, the idea is that um, it would make an uncomfortable airspace for bats and they, and they would leave the area. And research to date has shown that it, it is effective for some species, but not for all. And so we wanted to uh, capture individual bats and record their behavior at the species level um, using several different treatments to see what works best. And so as part of this project, we built this uh, large flight cage. Um, it's 60 meters long, so it kind of simulates the, the blade length of, of many wind turbines. Uh, and it's tall and wide enough for bats to maneuver around. Um, but because we were generating a, a, a sound to, to expose to these bats, we didn't want walls or a ceiling on it. So it's, it's relatively open air. There's just this fine mesh netting over it. Um, and it simulates more realistic environment for bats to be flying in. And we can observe their behaviors using uh, thermal cameras. <clears throat> Oops, let's see. And so here's just a quick video of, of some of the data that we get. You see this bat flying through the flight cage. This is just from one of the cameras, um, so only a section of the flight cage. And the software puts a little green box around the bat as it's, it's flying through it. And that and we can use this information to inform us where the bat is spending most of its time in the flight cage. So um, under control conditions, um, these bats tend to use the entire flight cage. They just fly back and forth. Um, but when a treatment is turned on, um, say the treatment is here on, or the deterrent is here on the left, we'll see bats using the, the right-hand side of the flight cage more. And we can find out where that distance is uh, and, and how effective that deterrent is uh, at pushing bats away from uh, the signal. And, and preliminary results um, show that the, the three treatments that we're looking at are all effective. Um, but uh, given that, the, the lower frequency option uh, of, for these devices might be the best because lower frequency sounds carry farther than high frequency sounds. And so we could just focus on that um, and, and interact with bat echolocation at a greater distance from the wind turbines. And the, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is our role in, in testing uh, these, these strike detector technologies. Um, and, and to do that, um, we, at the Flatirons campus, we helped install 
these sensors on the blades of the wind turbines, and then to simulate collision events to, to validate the technology, um, uh, Jason Rodman and, and, and Chris Ivanov and others um, built a specialized launcher and very unique projectiles that represent different mass, different sizes of, of, of targets that uh, resemble large, medium, and small birds and bats. And so the combination of these two um, <clears throat> allows us to hit the blades as the turbine is spinning um, and collect information on how well the sensors are working. Um, hopefully this, sh this shows up for you here, but this is just a test example of the, of the launcher projecting uh, one of these objects. Uh, right there, you see it um, shoot the target and it, it flies off into the distance. I think they're able to launch it at least 300 meters. But we can put this um, launcher on top uh, or connected to the man lift, raise it up and shoot directly into the wind turbine blades to, to get registrations on the, on the sensors. Um, so we've, you know, we've, we've been able to, to answer a lot of questions, um, but going forward as turbine technology changes, both onshore and offshore, it's going to, it basically is going to keep us on our toes. As, as turbines get bigger, um, they may have different um, impacts, different levels of impacts on, on birds and bats. Um, they are able to operate in new areas, and so there's new species that might be interacting with these structures. And of course, as we move offshore, um, there's a whole suite of, of interactions that we'll need to, to better understand. Uh, this research, unfortunately, is, is expensive, it's time consuming, and the results can be slow. Um, we, there's usually a period of activity and interactions with, with wind turbines, and so you can collect data in one season, but then have to wait a whole other year before you can collect data again. Um, so it kind of slows the pace of, of progress for our understanding. Um, and some of the strategies that we have um, are effective for some species, but not for others, but I think we're close to improving upon those solutions. And then going forward, um, collaborative research has, has shown success. Um, I think it's the right approach to, to bring in different perspectives, different experiences um, to develop solutions and technologies. And then um, outreach and engagement is, is really important as well to, to get this information out uh, to those who can use it to help them make decisions. Uh, and to that end, um, I won't go through all of these, but just to say that, um, you know, we're the research that we are involved with, um, we, we play our role in, in getting that out the door in, in reports and publications. And here are just a few examples of some that um, we've gotten out within the last couple of months and those that should be coming out um, in the next couple of months. So with, with that, I'll end and hand it over to Elliot. And um, thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hopefully everybody can see this. Click, 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 presentation mode. All right. Um, so I'm Elliot Vaughn. I've been at NREL for six and a half years. Um, my background is aerospace engineering um, with some atmospheric science thrown in in recent years. Uh, most of my work at NREL evolves around the application of high performance computing to understand the interactions between uh, regional weather and the wind plant operating environment, um, and as well as uh, wildlife in the last year or so. Um, I think this is a really exciting um, research space, especially for NREL, because we have a lot of unique capabilities to bring to the problem of trying to understand the behavior of eagles, um, namely our atmospheric science expertise, as well as our model flow modeling expertise. Uh, so this work to date has focused on uh, golden eagles, but really the, the modeling framework we're developing here could be extended readily to all um, obligate soaring raptor species um, and could be adapted to other species as well. Uh, so I apologize for the amount of text in the slide, but really this is all the high level information. Uh, this is a DOE sponsored project for two years that we're going to be wrapping up within the next calendar year. Uh, sorry, within this calendar year. Um, the project has two parts. 
The first part, which I won't be talking about today, focuses on mesoscale modeling. So trying to characterize the soaring habitat for these species of interest. Um, and to this effort, we uh, performed a 20 year hindcast with updated uh, flow modeling uh, strategies and also performed high, um, high resolution sampling to drive other work um, within this project and other efforts at NREL as well. Uh, so the, the new sampling uh, includes uh, two kilometer resolution as well as five minute um, output frequency. The, uh, most of the work that I'll be focused on today and talking about is the microscale aspects. So applying uh, flow modeling uh, techniques um, combined with machine learning, um, combined with uh, eagle telemetry data, so GPS units um, from uh, birds that we've captured and put uh, GPS units on um, in the form of little backpacks. Uh, so the idea is to, to better understand the behavior of um, species of interest under a variety of conditions, whether that's um, uh, different seasons, different times of day, as well as different regions within um, uh, within uh, any operating region where you might have wind turbines, um, and to also understand the environmental drivers as well that, that um, influence the behavior of these species. Um, and the resulting product will be open source, so anybody can use it, and uh, it should be uh, runnable without um, requirement of any HPC resources. I'd like to stress that this is a multi-scale problem. So if we're thinking about species that migrate and move over great distances, um, the, we think of these as landscape scales or mesoscales on the order of hundreds of kilometers. Um, and the relevant time scales here are on between minutes and days. Um, and this could be compared to uh, the micro scale. So this is now on the order of meters up to kilometers and time scales between seconds and minutes. Um, so everything shown on this slide uh, represents a, a computational modeling capability that we have at NREL. So the first part of uh, my talk will be focused on the atmospheric modeling. Um, we're using what we call a high fidelity approach. So these simulations can actually uh, resolve real weather patterns as well as resolve the turbulence within the atmospheric boundary layer in which uh, these eagles are flying in. Uh, we're using uh, state-of-the-art mesoscale to microscale coupling techniques. So products of other DOE investments from other uh, uh, A2E projects, namely MMC. Our approach is to use large eddy simulation. So that's the turbulence resolving aspect. Um, and then we are driving these simulations using uh, updated data, as I mentioned before, from the wind toolkit, um, from this updated 20 year hindcast. Um, is somebody uh, not on mute? Thank you. Uh, so, the region of interest here is a 50 by 50 kilometer region that uh, includes three different wind farms and complex terrain. Uh, these are simulations were, that are of unprecedented size. Um, from a large eddy simulation perspective. These are really massive and expensive simulations that require supercomputers uh, to perform. Uh, so as an example of a simulation uh, that we've run, uh, this is a diurnal cycle. So the diurnal aspect you can see on the lowermost panel that shows the heat flux. So due to the solar radiation um, warming up the surface of the earth, you can see the heat flux increases towards noon and decreases towards sunset. Uh, and as a result, you can see the temperature field or the temperature um, near the ground also increases due to the solar insulation. Um, and then we picked this day because the wind direction um, and wind speed uh, aren't changing drastically and there aren't any um, uh, significant uh, mesoscale weather effects. So this is sort of a nice, well-defined, but realistic case that represents uh, atmospheric dynamics that might influence eagle behavior. Uh, so first looking at this from a, a time averaged perspective, we can see this is clearly a three-dimensional three problem. So from left to right, we can see um, the flow averaged over the course of the day. And the flow is coming from, in this case, the southeast over the terrain shown below. And we can see just differences in the vertical velocity field shown here. Um, and this is what drives the, the eagle flight, is whether or not the vertical velocity is um, enough to sustain lift so that they can they can soar or glide without having to, to flap their wings, which is very energetically expensive. 
So we can see that, that there's significant differences in the updraft field, depending on whether you're very close to the ground, whether you're close to the rotor or hub height, or if um, you're above the rotor, let's say 500 meters or half a kilometer or so. Now, if we want to look at the behavior of the flow from an unsteady perspective, because this is an unsteady turbulent problem, uh, we can see here um, from slices uh, sampled from our MMC high fidelity large eddy simulation driven by the wind toolkit. Um, these are slices through the flow field um, that are aligned with uh, the approximately the mean wind direction. Um, and I'll let this play through a couple times. Uh, but Basically, we could, sh we could see how drastically the features of the, of the flow change. So on the top is the, is the horizontal wind speed with the warmer colors representing higher, higher speeds and the colder colors representing um, lower speeds. And on the bottom is the vertical velocity. So uh, red means that there's, whoops. Uh, uh, so red means that there's a significant updraft and we can see that over the course of the day, as the heat flux increases, the vertical velocity scale um, on the bottom right also increases, and we can see that the vertical, vertical structures start to organize. Um, and we can see that there's significant um, variation in the spatial extents, both vertically and horizontally, of these uh, convective features, um, the strength of their features, their separation in space, and also their frequency. Um, and all of this, of course, is related to the turbulence in the background flow. So again, these are all uh, characteristics of the atmosphere that we were actually able to resolve with our models. And what we're trying to do is take outputs from these simulations uh, to drive our behavioral models. So that takes me to the second part of the talk, which is our behavioral modeling approach. So the idea is to use publicly available um, data, whether it's from uh, whether it's from the wind toolkit or if it's from the high resolution rapid refresh data from NOAA, um, just whatever weather data you can get your hands on, um, as well as a digital elevation model. These are the inputs. And then from that, we can estimate updrafts uh, for different times of day and different seasons. So that forms the lower left figure um, is a representation of a time, um, time averaged vertical velocity field that an eagle traversing this terrain, which in the snapshot is about 50 by 50 kilometer region. Um, so what an eagle traversing this terrain might see. Um, and then the other part of this movement, um, sorry, our behavioral modeling approach is the movement modeling. Um, so here we used a fluid flow analogy that, um, that, showed, that calculates in, uh, a migratory potential uh, so it drives, so the gradient of this figure is what drives the uh, direction of the eagle flight. And so what's new here that we've done, and I'll show on the upcoming slides, is we've added a stochastic component. So um, the original model assumes perfect knowledge of the eagle, um, by the eagle of the operating conditions, and it assumes that it'll always be flying with one clear intent, whereas in reality, there isn't perfect knowledge. Um, the behavior is driven by a variety of stimuli and environmental factors. So what we've done is introduce this component of stochasticity that allows the eagle to take missteps and fly in different directions. So to validate our approach, uh, we've used um, a data set provided by Conservation Science Global that involves a very large number of GPS data points from tagged uh, eagles in the region. And the region of interest here is in Wyoming. Um, and from the available data, we can see that there's a lot more data in the spring and summer, and there's a lot less in the winter. And the data heights um, are significantly higher uh, in the warmer months, just due to availability of updrafts. The birds are more, and birds are likely to be more active just because there's a, a better flight environment. Uh, so with all of these data points, we are actually only able to extract three distinct, um, well-defined flight uh, flight trajectories that represented a, a, a represented a long distance movement. So, from these three uh, different validation tracks that I'll show here, um, the first shows westbound movement, and we can see that uh, for 500 virtual eagles um, simulated by our model released from the right edge of the domain, uh, this can be aggregated into a presence 
a relative density presence map on the right. And we can see that as it approaches the wind farm, uh, in this case, it um, it detours and tries to uh, get away from the turbines, and then it uh, resumes its original trajectory um, that was predicted by our model. Uh, similarly, in this case for northbound movement, uh, the same idea is that an eagle approaching the wind plants will see the turbines, and then it will sort of uh, it'll it'll be attracted towards the region that has uh, the predicted by our model that has the highest um, uh, likelihood of presence. And then this is again similarly. For southbound movement, so uh, 500 virtual eagles released from the top of the domain, um, and how that approaches the wind farm and again uh, follows the trajectory that's predicted by our model. Uh, so these are very new results. Um, so this is, uh, I, I, I forgot to mention earlier, but our model has two modes of operation. The first is an offline mode um, that is intended for, say, siting purposes or wind plant design purposes. So in this approach, we represent, uh, we select representative conditions across different times of day and different seasons. In this case, we've re uh, released 500 eagles. Um, and what we're looking at here is hourly mean data from 500 eagles released from the southern boundary pursuing northbound migration. So we can see that as the time of day changes, just due to the unsteadiness of the background flow that's modeled by our, um, our High fidelity MMC LES simulation. We can see that depending on the time of day, um, the eagles are drawn to different parts of the wind farm. Um, and here, the turbines here you can think of as a proxy for the underlying terrain where most of the turbines were constructed on ridge lines. Um, so we can see a lot of spatial and temporal variability in, in where eagles might um, might want to fly under a variety of conditions. Um, and our hope is that this information could be leveraged in some way to inform our, our presence model and our setting tools. Uh, similarly, now in online mode, so this is if we had information about an eagle that was observed by say an identified system, um, so cameras that are installed at the facility to monitor and, and perform informed curtailment. So we can see that here, if we knew that an eagle was coming from say this direction, uh, given the realistic background um, turbulent flow conditions, we can see that, again, the project predicted trajectory, the most likely tra trajectory varies over time and space. So sometimes it follows the ridge line and other times a, a change in wind direction. So in this case, um, the flow, it, the, it, the eagle is flying with a crosswind and the flow direction is changing over approximately 10 or 20 degrees. And that's enough to sort of uh, introduce variability in where the bird wants to fly. So we think this information could be used to inform um, uh, real-time uh, informed curtailment strategies as well as uh, um, deployment strategies, as I mentioned before. In summary, uh, we've developed a, a tool that can provide probabilistic uh, presence density maps. It doesn't require any prohibitive data collection. Um, it inc includes an aspect of stochasticity, so it includes spatial temporal variability in due to the wind, and it also includes uncertainty due to the just eagle behaviors. Um, and our upcoming work is going to be uh, involved <coughs> in coding different uh, environmental and atmospheric information for a variety of conditions just to further generalize this model uh, through uh, machine learning techniques. So there's a large number of contributors um, to this work. Uh, we have two fantastic postdocs from El Sandu and Regis Dayton, um, and there's the rest of the team, as well as our external collaborators from West, USGS, and Conservation Science Global. Um, and we also have a joint appointment from Lafayette College, uh, so David Brandis, who developed the original fluid flow analogy model, will be joining us this summer. And that's all I got. Um, Thanks for your attention. And coming up next, uh, I'd like to hand this off to John, who will talk about machine learning applied to the tracking of biological objects. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Yeah, my name is John Yarbrough, and I'm a physicist at, out of NREL. I've been here for 14 years, and I've been working on developing novel characterization tools and data analytic techniques to obtain a better fundamental understanding of biological systems, primarily focused on fungal and bacterial systems on biomass, degrading it 
but also been able to extend that work into studying and understanding bat behavior in and around these wind turbines. And as Chris had mentioned in his talk, there's a ton of data that we can collect and analyze, but there's a lot of misunderstanding on the mitigation, the behavior, and the way to do this is using thermal cameras. But because of the way that where the technology currently exists, it is time consuming, labor intensive and expensive. And so we sought out to actually develop a system that alleviates the complexity of analyzing the data, allows more of an automation system and be able to give real time characteristics of an incident when it happens at the wind site. Normally, a lot of that video is fed in, stored and then collected months later here and analyze what's there here we're actually have the ability to do real-time detection and that's where we're going to talk about our uh, machine learning based thermal camera system that can detect identify and track biological targets and this work really stemmed working with paul crime from usgs in which he back in 2014 did a study on bat behavior in around wind turbines in which he utilized thermal video cameras near infrared video acoustic detectors as well as radar and yet, unfortunately, he heavily relied on using a complex MATLAB code as well as complex imaging processing techniques. And what that meant was is that he, in essence, these wind turbines are moving. He went in and visually sub and subtracted the pixel color of the wind turbine. The problem with that is, is once you go from one operating system to the next, that wind turbine can pop back up. If you change operating systems, you change any type of environment, it brings in, it, 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 causes issues with your processing technique. So you have to go back and rework your system. And it also heavily relied on human visualization in which they had to go through 1300 hours of video to verify, track and identify and store this information to study this behavior. Extremely labor intensive. But he was successful in being able to study the bat behavior and the bird behavior at these wind turbines. So it was a successful study except it was extremely time consuming and that's where we wanted to expand. So I started working with Paul on this problem to optimize his MATLAB code and the uh, image processing techniques. And I asked him simply, have you ever considered using a combination of computer vision with machine learning? And that was the catalyst that started this entire work. And so we want to look at what the current capabilities of object detection with an open source computer vision. It's out there, it's open source through Python, OpenCV, anybody can use it. And what we saw was with open source capabilities, we can identify new objects within the field of view. We can look at the flight characteristics, object tracking, the flight path. We can study the interaction with the turbine and look at that behavior. As Chris mentioned, avoidance behavior or attraction behavior. Do you have multiple species that avoid the turbine with ultrasound? Others are attractive. You can study that behavior, but the main drawback is that it detects all moving objects. As we see here, the wind turbine is moving we are actually collecting the entire wind turbine as well as this object, which is a bat flying in and around the field of view. So we can track and collect information on that bat flying, but we are also collecting all, all this information is being stored in the algorithm. And so somebody has to go back and manually remove all of those detections in order just to get to that main object. So this is where we have explored and want to use artificial intelligence in order to address this problem. And what is AI? A lot of people want to know what that question is. Well, it's intelligence exhibited by machines. And the definition is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human or human intelligence or a way of making a computer think intelligently in a similar manner that humans think. And we're seeing a huge encroachment of AI into all of our daily lives through traffic, energy store shopping we are being inundated with artificial intelligence and so we want to know can we take this ai which we've seen great in autonomous vehicles image detection face recognition and apply it to actual thermal cameras and within artificial intelligence there are multiple areas in which we can explore machine uh, natural languages speeches and we want to focus on a combination of computer vision with image recognition, as well as deep learning for predictive analytics. As you just saw Elliot speak, they're able to they want to predict the flight path of eagles based off of the environment and all the variables. We want to do the same with um, these thermal cameras. And this is one of the best 
visual graphics I've seen that, that help visually explain what deep learning by convolutional neural networks are. And what convolutional neural networks are is that it, it's software that mimics how the brain works. The brain has a lot of neurons that are interconnected and information is fed continuously through all these neurons. And so that's exactly what we do, but we do it within the software. And so here you have an input layer in which we insert an image into the machine learning model. It begins to identify like dark pixel values and then goes into what we call the deep learning aspect, the hidden layers, in which goes through and enables to identify edges, combination of edges and features, and then has the ability to spit out information and, that, and takes all of that information and comes up with an output, George. And so here we input an image of George, goes through the model and spits out, hey, this is an image of George. That's what we wanted to do. And the benefit of computer vision is that these computers, the human eye has tremendous resolution, but it doesn't have the ability to inspect individual pictures within an image. Computers have that ability. That's what gives the power of computer vision. And so we wanted to enhance our computer vision with machine learning. And so we were able to couple existing open source computer vision software with machine learning AI. And we wanted to build an initial binary model of object detection algorithm to capture an event. And what we did is that we built our model based off of taking bad images, a series of bird images, as well as non-biological. And we trained this model to distinguish between a biological object and a non-biological object. This is a binary model. In our initial result, we looked at the precision recall curve, which this simply shows how your models has the ability to accurately identify an object. And we had an area under the curve, almost one, which says, yes, our binary system does have the ability to distinguish between biological and non-biological objects. That was very exciting. So we then took it and built our data sets on non-biological objects. We took images of the nacelle, of the rotor, of the tower, and then the clouds. And the reason why we chose these images is that we ran just a simple background subtractive computer vision object detector, and it detected all of these objects. And so therefore, during the night, during the day, the thermal camera is actually picking up points of the nacelle, the rotor, the tower, and the clouds, even when they're not moving. So we fed all that information into the non-biological training set. And what we were able to do is build a rather interesting binary model. And so we developed four different models in which we actually increased the number of training images in order to prove the accuracy. And then we tested it on 56 videos in which when these videos we visually inspected and detected and saw that there were 4,000 images of biological objects and over 24,000 images of non-biological. So if you just use normal computer vision, your system would have detected 24,000 false positives. We want to eliminate that. And what we saw was as we increase the number of biological and non-biological, our overall accuracy greatly improved to the point where our fourth iterated model was highly accurate. Same with non-biological. As we went and improved the number, increased the number of images, we saw a good overall increase in the accuracy to the point where we now have a binary system that can detect biological objects with a 97% accuracy and we have a 99% accuracy of distinguishing non-biological objects. In talking with Chris and other um, people in this field, humans have a typical accuracy of 75%. So we've now built a system that does outperform humans, does it automatically, and does it with normally take three or four months to analyze the videos. We can now do it within a week. So now we're able to accelerate our research within this field. But we didn't want to stop there. Because just because you have a biological object, you still have to have a human go back and determine if it's a bat, bird, insect, what is that object? So we built a multi-classification system in which here's the confusion matrix. It just shows a lot of the statistics. But what it does is that we built a system that now has a 90% accuracy in identifying a biological object as a bat, 83% accuracy defined as a bird, and it's 69% accuracy of defined, identifying as an insect. We can now track and identify and study the number, you know, what is the insect doing in and around these wind turbines? What are the bats doing? Is there a correlation between presence of bats and presence of insects? And it has a 99% accuracy of detecting non-biological. And as you can see, we greatly increase the number of images. This is a great point that uh, we can now start using to track and study 
animal behavior. But I've shown a lot of facts and figures, and what I want to show is this actually in real time, what this system actually does. And here what we have on your left is a simple background subtraction, which you can get from any open source um, software, and it has no biological object. And here we have, we're simply applying the binary machine learning model. And what you see here is that the rotor lights up and the clouds light up. But as we're applying that binary machine learning model, we have completely eliminated the detection on the blade. It's not that we're not detecting the blade. We're still detecting the blade, but we're tra but we're basically telling the system ignore the wind turbine. So now we have the ability to track. So once again, here we have a biological object in a dynamic background, and here we're using the multi classification system, in which, as you see, blade lights up. We can track the object, but now we've got a system. Now it's tracking the object, ignores the wind turbine, and now accurately identifies that object as a bat. So now as we're collecting data over the night, we have the ability to record the tracks, record the object, and be able to spit that information out in the morning to where the researchers don't have to go back and visually inspect all of the video. We can also do with machine learning with the biological object of a bird. Here you're going to see a bird, a flock of uh, birds coming in, and the machine learning is able to pick it up, track it, and identify it accurately as a bird as well as with insects. You'll see over here as the insect comes in, he's kind of quick. But the machine learning, the model is able to pick up that at an at object and identify it as, a, as an insect. So now that we've got a system that can detect objects, we want to be able to track it. And so now we've been, we have the ability to incorporate a tracking and recording in the flight path. And so here what we have is that we have the same image, but now we've got the bat and we classify it. Hey, this is a bat object one. In this case, we call it zero, but and it's able to actually identify and track that bat as it flies through the field of view. And so now what we can do is record that flight path. And so here, as you remember, you've seen the bat flew in, came up, went around the nacelle or the wind turbine, left the scene, came back in, flew through the rotor swept area and out of the, the, of the, skirt, of the view. Here we also had a second bat that came at the very edge of the corner. This is what we wanted to be able to do is identify the bat and then track its motion because now we can start studying how these deterrent mechanisms are working at the wind turbine. Here's another example where we had eight bats within this one video frame and here you have the wind turbine and what you see is that you do see several different behaviors. Here you've got one bat that just simply flies to the field of view, another one that approaches the wind turbine and leaves, you've got some going from top to bottom, but then you had this one bat that just came in and hung out around this area. Now you can start adding that um, deterrent mechanism and you can start studying the behavior at the wind turbine, which is what, if you look at what Elliot had been doing, they've been able to collect a bunch of data and be able to model it. Now what we have the ability to do is collect that data, put it together and start doing predictive analytics on the behavior and what within the, within the different environment variables, how the bat, bat might behave and predict that behavior ultimately leading to more artificially driven smart curtailment. So what have we been able to build? We built a powerful solution to thermal imaging systems used to study bats in multiple scenarios, not just wind turbines. What I didn't show is that we've tested the system on bats flying out of buildings, bats flying out of caves, and it has a very high accuracy of being able to pick them up and identify them as bats. We have a 97% accuracy in distinguishing biological objects. We have a rather high accuracy of to be able to distinguish between bats at 90%, birds at 83%, and insects at 69%. We've also built a cost-effective thermal tracking system. This can run on laptops or small Raspberry Pi circuit boards. It can run on inexpensive thermal cameras, and it's easily deployable at current wind farms or other research sites. It is, it's compatibility with other thermal tracking systems, so ones that have done the complex image processing techniques, they can embed these models into their system and enhance their overall performance. It does offer versatility and object of detection, not just bats, but all moving biological and non-biological objects. We do offer the ability to do path characterization and it's open source platform. We are gonna be releasing this in a month or two to where anybody can use it. It's free, it's accessible, it's easily adaptable by research groups, and there's very little maintenance to the algorithms is needed. And so our goal with this work is to get it out to researchers to be able to further their research. So I wanna thank all of our contributors that have worked on this project as well as um, 
the Wind Energy Technology Office. And with that, I will turn it over to Rebecca. Excellent. Thanks so much, John. Can you see my slides OK? Yes. OK, fantastic. Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm Rebecca Green, and I'm a senior project leader and scientist uh, for NREL, where I've been for about two and a half years now. Uh, my background, my PhD is in biological oceanography. Um, and I previously worked at BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in their Environmental Studies Program uh, for about nine years. So it's my pleasure to pivot to specifically talking about offshore wind and environmental considerations uh, with you today. First of all, I wanted to place environmental considerations within the context of the larger world of offshore wind siting and really all of the aspects of, of siting uh, that we work on together at NREL. Uh, when we think about offshore wind, there are now 29 states that have the potential to generate offshore wind energy from the Atlantic coast through the Gulf Coast, up along the Pacific and including Hawaii, and around the Great Lakes. And the various considerations that we take into account when citing offshore wind include, of course, our core capability at NREL of technology and water depth considerations. We also look at fishing activity and high value fishing grounds. Of course, wildlife and habitat, which I'll be focusing on with you today. Uh, we also give consideration to visual impacts, shipping lanes, DOD considerations, and cultural resources. I wanted to provide a specific example from the US East Coast associated with offshore wind leasing, the accelerated pace of that leasing, and of course, consideration for um, an array of wildlife migratory uh, ranges and pathways that need to be considered. So offshore wind leasing is now occurring, uh, as you can see in the map here on the left, all the way from the Carolinas up through Massachusetts and uh, for with a floating project in Maine as well. Uh, these are two examples of marine animals that we need to consider when sighting offshore wind, certainly the North Atlantic right whale as a critically endangered species with less than 400 uh, individuals um, alive uh, in waters now um, is a, a huge consideration uh, for offshore wind development. Um, and in fact, there are numerous mitigations associated with that animal, uh, marine animal. Um, as well, uh, the other example I wanted to use is of a seabird species, the northern gannet, which is one of the largest seabird, uh, seabirds in uh, North Atlantic waters, and similarly has a wide migratory range, in this case, all the way from the Gulf Coast up into Canadian waters. So there are two projects that I'd like to discuss with you uh, today, both uh, DOE funded, our U.S. Offshore Wind Synthesis of Environmental Effects Research Project, or SEER project, as we fondly, fondly call it, and our REN Horizon Scan work, which Chris briefly touched upon. So I'll be talking about these two projects, both related to offshore wind and also largely in the, in the stakeholder engagement space. So our SEER project is a multi-year DOE-funded collaborative effort in which we're um, facilitating knowledge transfer for offshore wind environmental research from around the world. We're currently synthesizing this information and we'll be disseminating it soon, starting this summer. Uh, we're synthesizing the information to inform applicability to both U.S. East and West Coast waters with their very different considerations, and we'll then be prioritizing future research needs. In terms of synthesis and the types of environmental uh, effects that we're talking about, these include wildlife effects, um, habitat and habitat utilization, as well as related environmental processes. And I really... Um, want to highlight the collaborative nature of this work. Uh, we have a great uh, science and technology committee and are involving regional partners uh, from both coasts um, to help contribute 
to our materials and to be sure that we're reducing redundancy and catalyzing solution development. So our project team is um, a joint lab team effort between NREL and PNNL. From NREL, we have uh, myself, Chris Hine, and Frank O'Terry. From PNNL, we have Ginevra harker Climbs, Alicia Gordon, and Mark Severy. Um, so really a great team to work together with. Uh, within DOE, WIDO, Jocelyn Brown Saraceno is our program manager, and Naomi Lewandowski has also been contributing to the work. And then, of course, our partners, including our Science and Technology Advisory Committee, subject matter experts who are contributing to and reviewing our projects, our products, and West and East Coast specific expertise and engagement. So the primary product of the SEER program project right now are these is a series of educational research briefs um, that um, are easily can be easily sim uh, assimilated by our stakeholders, including the public, um, any folks. Uh, within within agencies who may be uh, may need to understand these materials, and then we'll also be producing a webinar series. So these uh, series of research briefs uh, will each include uh, considerations of environmental effects associated with a priority issue, monitoring tools and assessment methods for that issue, minimization strategies, and research needs. And we. Um, honed in on eight priority topics based on a huge amount of stakeholder engagement, which lasted for many months across interviews, webinars, Google Forms, our, our s and committee, and an IPF session. And all of the materials that we develop will be available within and linked to within TFIS. So what are these eight priority topics that we're currently developing educational research briefs for? And I've listed them here. Um, certainly a topic that's received years and even decades of attention and research is the underwater noise effects on marine life. Uh, we've just finished a draft of that research brief and it's under review. We're also looking at collision risk for birds and bats and we've heard quite about that quite a bit about that from the other speakers today. We're looking at floating system cable interactions with marine life benthic disturbance, the impact of introducing new structures, be behavioral effects on birds and bats, the presence of vessels in offshore waters, and electromagnetic effects. Uh, so the last slide I wanted to present for SEER before jumping into, into my last few minutes talking about the horizon scan is that after we finish these research briefs on our webinar series, we will be holding two regional workshops, hopefully in the fall of this year, one on the U.S. East and West Coast. We'll be building on our research briefs and the, and the gaps identified in those briefs and discussing regional research priorities on both coasts uh, with our partners partners and interested stakeholders, so building on um, existing regional roadmaps, frameworks, and environmental programs, working with regional entities such as the RWSE and POWER, and ultimately developing a workshop proceedings which will make widely available. So now I'd like to pivot to my last couple of slides and talk about our um, REN her, uh, Environmental Horizon Scan, which is live now. So we'll talk a bit more about that. And I would welcome any of you to participate in that and to join um, our mailing list as we can sit, uh, continue with the, this horizon scanning work. Um, Chris already talked a bit about REN, so I won't I won't talk any more about that and, and certainly the association with IEA WIND. What we're doing is conducting a systematic assessment uh, using feedback from the global wind energy and wildlife communities to identify priority environmental issues for both land-based and offshore wind um, over the next five to 10 years. Our scope is onshore and offshore wind, wildlife and environmental sciences involving the international community and multiple uh, stakeholder groups ultimately to inform global wind wildlife priorities and REN state of the science activities. 
Our NREL team is leading this effort with a very engaged steering committee. Our team includes myself, Liz Gill, and Chris Hine from DOE, uh, Jocelyn Brown Saracino, and Naomi Lewandowski, and our REN members who I've listed here. And of course, the participants who are actually responding to our horizon scan, uh, who come from a, a, the worldwide wind and wildlife community. So what exactly is horizon scanning? In a nutshell, it's a process uh, where we systematically investigate evidence about future trends or future horizons, uh, prior including priority and emerging issues in science and policy. We're using something called the decision Delphi technique. Um, and, our, and our horizon scan, which is currently live, um, has a variety of questions both on the participants background and priority environmental issues, for example, stressor receptor relationships. Um, I'm zooming through this for the sake of time, but I would like to say that uh, our horizon scan is now live. We launched it on April 16th. We would love your feedback. So I put the link here in the slide and we'll also put it into the chat. Our analysis will be continuing over the upcoming months through various iterations of this horizon scan as we collate responses um, and narrow down the list of priority topics for both onshore and offshore. Again, we're planning to disseminate our results uh, widely uh, to the community using a wind exchange thesis and ultimately a journal article. So overall, I'd just like to say in terms of both um, this REN work, our SEER project, and other work that, that we're doing for DOE and our other partners, that these collaborative efforts um, overall will help us to identify our various science priorities um, in the offshore, onshore and offshore wind wildlife space um, over the upcoming years. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me at any time. And I will go ahead and turn um, turn the mic back over to Chris uh, for any Q and A. Thanks, Rebecca, um, and thanks, Elliot and John, for taking time to present today. Um, we do just have um, another five minutes for Q and A. So if you um, have any questions um, for the presenters or, or myself. Um, either use the raise hand function um, or enter the question into the chat. Um, if you if you have a question that comes up later on, feel free to contact me or any of the speakers, um, uh, and and we'll, we're happy to answer those. Uh, maybe uh, I'll kick off with a question for Rebecca while people are are maybe thinking. Um, Rebecca, what what are the differences with respect to different foundation types um, for offshore wind? Are there different like potential interactions for floating versus fixed bottom foundations? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for seeding our Q&A, Chris. So we are looking at both um, fixed bottom and floating foundations uh, with fixed bottom um, as part of the initial uh, supply, uh, deployment scenarios along the Atlantic coast. Uh, but certainly floating foundations in deeper waters off the Pacific and even in deeper waters off the Atlantic and possibly other regions as well, such as in the Great Lakes. Um, so depending on the foundation types, um, we of course see very different interactions uh, related to, to benthic disturbance, uh, construction noise, um, impacts, and, and all of the stressor receptor uh, relationships. And I think construction noise is, is a really um, interesting one to look at because um, impact pile driving um, at tr for, with traditional uh, fixed bottom foundations has um, been a, a source of concern and uh, there are lots of solutions related to that. And once we get into floating uh, foundations, just as an example, um, noise will be uh, less of a concern in that case. And with some, some of the other alternative foundation types, uh, such as a, su a suction bucket and gravity-based designs. Thank you. Um, so uh, Caroline had a question 
Are there plans for future considerations um, regarding biological groups that live within the ground as new wind turbines are installed both uh, on and offshore? Um, for for offshore, um, I think I think that is a, a consideration depending on on the region and the species that might be impacted. So there, um, you know, there are, are endangered like ground species, uh, ground squirrel species, um, turtles that burrow into the ground that um, I think are certainly considered. They, the the information we have on it is is limited. It's not as well studied as as um, some of the Critters that I mentioned, the, the birds and, and eagles. Um, but uh, Rebecca, you want to speak to like the benthic environment and, and uh, wildlife or um, on the ocean floor? Yeah, certainly. So um, impacts on the the benthos and benthic disturbance in the offshore receives a lot of attention um, for invertebrates, any benthic epifauna. Um, and certainly considering um, both both disturbance, um, looking at artificial reef impacts and uh, possible impacts from from EMF and and sound as well as it penetrates into the seabed. So um, th this is receiving uh, consideration, and there was a really good um, oceanographic. Um, uh, Society Journal that recently came out with some good articles in this regard. Thanks. Um, Elliot, what um, can the, the work that you're doing um, be applied to other wildlife? And if so, what kind of information do you need in order to work with the atmospheric data that you have? Right, great question. Um, so what we've developed here is a, is a modeling framework. So really we can plug in information about any species of interest. Um, so that uh, that is some plan of future work to, to um, in, incorporate data from other sources. So the more GPS telemetry data we have, the better. But in addition to that, we'd like to consult with uh, species and experts and biologists to really understand uh, species dependent behavior um, to really separate out what is the behavior due to just that species versus uh, behavior that's driven by the um, environment and the atmosphere. Um, so really um, just, uh, um, I guess, quantitative data as well as qualitative information from experts is, is what we need to extend our model to other species, but it's certainly um, within reach within our current computational framework. Great, thanks. Um, and just uh, we got about a minute left, but I wanted to get uh, a question for John. Um, John, what are some of the next steps that you're looking at um, in uh, you know to build on what you've um, developed so far? Yes, yeah, so what we've built so far. So what we want to do now is expand this work from 2D to 3D cameras, so that way we can start getting distance and we can improve our identification of these animals as well as start building machine learning models that can basically classify the behavior of the bats, of the insects, of the birds. That way then we can then move into um, tracking them, classifying them, and then hopefully move into predictive analytics to where once the bat enters the field, what is the behavior predicted to where you can then modify spark curtailment, what to do with the wind turbine. So that's, that's the direction we're going. Super, uh, thanks. And um, I just want to thank everybody again for joining today's webinar. Um, Alex put in the chat um, details on the next um, webinar in the series, uh, which will be on artificial intelligence. That'll be in June. Uh, Alex, do you want to say anything before we all sign off? Uh, no, um, for those of you who are interested in learning about uh, our other research capabilities at NREL, there's a variety of links in the chat box. Um, we would love to see you and join our uh, future webinars in the series. Um, and I think we can adjourn. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.